So today I want to talk about uh, symmetry protected topological phases that uh, Paul already what? Hmm? Okay. <laughs> so welcome again. <laughs> So I'm talking about symmetry protected topological phases. And uh, in fact, I, I want to introduce some framework that will allow uh, to classify and characterize symmetry protected topological phases in basically general one dimensional systems. So both in interacting and non interacting systems. And in principle, it also works on fermionic systems, but then there's like a few extra tricks that I will neglect. So I will only focus on bosonic systems, so including spin systems, systems of uh, hardcore bosons, etc. And the um, most important tool that we're going to need are matrix product states, which you might recall from last lecture. But let me just start off by giving a very brief summary of what we uh, discussed last time. But I want to just stress two important findings. So the first one was the kind of area law. Basically, what I stated is that ground states of gapped um, local Hamiltonians are very special in that we know that all their ground states will live in a tiny corner of the Hilbert space. And this uh, corner of the Hilbert space uh, has the property, at least in, in one dimension, that the entanglement entropy uh, is independent of the system size. So what I mean is if I just look at a chain of length L and just form a bipartition by cutting into two half chains, say, of equal length, and let us look how does this entanglement between those two half chains increase as we make L larger. I argue that this would be constant. Good. Uh, sorry, this is like for, for one dimensional systems. And this was an important finding because, and I furthermore argued, that if we have states that fulfill this area law, we actually have the of Schmidt decomposition, and we found that the Schmidt coefficients decayed very rapidly. And by this, I argued that there is a way to efficiently compress these states to so called matrix product states. So, the second important thing I said was uh, I introduced matrix product states. So, and furthermore, I pointed out that the matrix product state representation is not unique. Right? So basically, we have a certain gauge choice how we choose these matrices. So I wanted to choose, or I did introduce a, uh, a choice that I found very convenient. And this was in the following way. I then just say that, well, let us just consider an infinite large system. So we have uh, a system which is translation invariant and infinitely large. And then I said that, well, this wave function on the infinite system is described by some amplitudes in the many-body wave function in, in sort of local basis. And for this, I said that we can then express the state in the following way using this graphical notation where I say that we have some tensors gamma and lambda where these objects here, gamma, is some index i, alpha, beta. And this corresponds in this graphical notation. So we have just this dot, which is the tensor itself. It's a rank 3 tensor. And we have three indices sticking out. And this is an alpha, beta, and i. And for those tensors, lambda, alpha, we just express it as just something with two legs sticking out, and this is then basically it's a diagonal tensor, so we have uh, just uh, we can just have this index alpha here. So, 
So this is now the representation. And if I just draw a picture like this, where I just connect lines between these tensors, these are tensor contractions. So what I argued last time is that if I just define some tensor here of a certain dimension, then I will, after s multiplying all these tensors, or basically of after summing over all those closed lines, I will find the amplitudes of the many-body wave function. So basically here, the open indices are the uh, indices kind of in, in with respect to some local basis. So we could have here I1, I2, I3 to I infinity. So again, so we have these matrices or these tensors. Once we contract all of them, so we just multiply all of them together, then we, get fi we find the amplitudes in the many-body wave function for an infinite system. Who is happy with this representation? I see uh, some people nodding. Okay, so, so now we have a way uh, by which we actually reduced the number of free parameters by a lot, because we have an, we have an infinite state, so it's a state defined on an infinite system. So in principle, if I want to write down this number exactly, I would need an infinite number of complex, like, like, like uh, enormous number of uh, 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 kind of complex numbers to, to, to express this information. However, in this form here, all the information that I need to store is contained in this rank three tensor gamma and this uh, lambda that we have here. So we have a very compact form of storing the information in the wave function, yes? That will, right, this actually um, depends on the state. So if you take, for example, like uh, this AKLT state, this F. Like Kennedy Leap and Tasaki state that I closed with uh, um, the last lecture, that is a state, that, uh, that's a Hamiltonian, that's AKLT Hamiltonian, to which the exact ground state can be written as a, uh, uh, in, in this form, where this index alpha and beta are only uh, uh, two dimensional. So in that case, you have an exact representation. These are so-called finitely correlated states. And there are several examples where you can do this. Uh, also, this um, GHZ state, like this all spins up plus all spins down, that state can again be expect ex 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 uh, ex uh, ex can be expressed exactly using this form. But if we take a generic, ha not fine-tuned Hamiltonian, then we actually will only find a very good approximation, and if we want to have an exact representation, this dimension would indeed be infinite, um, infinite dimensional. But for gapped systems, we can get basically arbitrarily close to the exact solution with rather small um, bond dimension or bond dimension of these tensors. Yes? Yes? Yes, this is what I want to explain now, because this was the other important point that I made last time, and we're going to use this again, is that what we could do for our system was the so-called Smith decomposition, which basically means we just choose a given bond and form a partition that we just say that, well, let us, let us now express the wave function as a sum over alpha, uh, alpha left, lambda, alpha, alpha, then I just argued that these um, alpha left and alpha right, these forming uh, orthogonal uh, bases for the left part and the right part. In this case, where I have a matrix product state representation that is truncated, this will basically only form a basis of the subspace on the left that is actually relevant to form this wave function psi. And the reason why I've chosen this particular form of the matrix product state is that if I actually take my tensors and only contract them uh, up to some sort of dangling, um, so, so this is coming from infinity, if I just contract all the tensors coming from left infinity to this dangling bond, then this is actually the matrix product state representation of the left Schmidt state alpha, where it just fixes index alpha to number alpha, and then we have this lambda here. So this is the lambda tensor here that we've uh, chosen. And then the same, like equivalently, for the right part. If we just contract 
all the tensors uh, to the right, we get the uh, uh, a matrix product state representation of these right Schmidt states. Okay? And a way to check if a given matrix product state is in this canonical form, I argued that we can look at the dominant eigenvectors of the left and right transfer matrix because this is what we get from uh, forming, calculating the overlap to make sure that the states alpha are orthogonal to each other. Good. So this was basically simply just repeating what I said last time, but this is we, 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 we're going to use this a lot now. So for symmetry-protected topological phases, symmetries will be essential, as the name suggests. So let us now do the following. Let us assume that we have a wave function, uh, which could be the ground state of some Hamiltonian that we are interested in. And let us assume that um, psi is uh, invariant uh, under some side symmetry, under uh, some sort of side symmetry. I don't know if this is a What do I mean by side symmetry? I mean that if we take the wave function psi and we act on it with a, with a symmetry operation of the following form, we just have the product or the tensor product over j, like j and uh, the sides, of uj, uh, like of, of some symmetry operation g, and this acting on psi. And the state should be invariant under this symmetry operation, which means that if I just do this operation, apply this operation to the state, I just get some, some phase factor i to the, uh, e to the i phi times psi. Just for a concrete example, you could take the Ising paramagnet. So and if you take the Ising paramagnet, as Paul said, th this state is uh, invariant under uh, Z2 symmetry. And in that case, um, this operator here would be simply the product of I think in that basis, like a sigma z operator. So we just apply, have a product over sigma z operators on all sides, and the wave function that uh, that we, uh, or like the wave function, the ground state in the paramagnetic phase is invariant under this symmetry operation. Okay. So let us assume that our system is invariant under this kind of uh, symmetry, and moreover, throughout my so every argument that I'm using today, I will assume that the Hamiltonian uh, or the ground state of the Hamiltonian is protected by a gap and consequently the, um, uh, um, the correlation functions decay exponentially. So let us now take a state psi that is symmetric under some on-site symmetry operation of this form and just look at um, the matrix product state representation of this. So we take now the matrix product state representation of psi. Again, I'm using my gamma lambda notation. And I want to act with a symmetry operation on the state. So since maybe we can draw this together. So how does it look like? So if I just apply this operation to this state, so how, how would I draw this? Sticking out vertically, right? Yes. So what we actually get is, so these are the physical indices, and we just act with some symmetry operation. Uh, this one would be our U here on, on these legs. So, okay, so now using this graphical notation, I did exactly this. I just basically write this expression in the language of uh, these um, tensor uh, representation. But now I want the overlap of this to be, uh, I want the state not to change. In order to check this, I will actually just multiply this with psi again, which means I just take the conjugate of this and multiply this here. Star, star. And I want 
this one to have uh, a modulus 1. Because basically, this means if a state doesn't change under the symmetry operation, the modulus should be 1. And similar to what I argued last time, what does it mean if I calculate the modulus and the modulus is equal to 1? In order to calculate the modulus, I have to just multiply these transfer matrices many, many times. So this is actually uh, equivalent with saying, or to saying that a sort of mixed transfer matrix Uh, where this is u, um, has as a dominant eigenvector, dominant eigenvector, uh, oh, sorry, eigenvalue of uh, modulus modulus uh, one. Good. So this is uh, just basically rephrasing the symmetry requirement in terms of our matrix product state language. Now, what does, it, what does it actually tell us about how a given matrix or tensor, or matrix three tensor, is transforming under symmetries? So let us just continue drawing pictures. Oopsie. So let us take some tensor gamma and apply to it our symmetry operation. Now, one choice that I could say that, oh, so here's some index, uh, uh, yeah, so, so you have like alpha, beta, say i, and just because may, may not everyone is familiar with this language, what this actually means in regular formation is that I have the sum over, say, uh, you use here uh, uh, J. Let me see. So now we have U, say J, J prime, gamma J prime. So basically, this is what I do. I just take one index. Oh, sorry, here. You let me just also use J here because otherwise, you might con confuse it with some complex I later on. So, so basically, this contraction here is I'm just multiplying, I'm just summing here over the J prime uh, index. Now, if I actually say that, well, this, these tensors here transform in the following way, namely that this is actually just J gamma J with some unitary transformation. So V is a unitary. Uh, that commutes with my diagonal matrix lambda. Then clearly we see if our matrices in the matrix product state transform in this way, this is necessarily true, right? Because if I say that, well, I actually do this transformation, this transforms into uh, V and uh, V dagger, that commute with m this lambda here, I can just remove them and I see that, well, what I actually get is again the transfer matrix, or it's basically the overlap of identical states. The reverse is also true using a few um, steps of math. You can also show that from, so, so I, what I e can easily show is that from this form of transforming the tensors, we find that the modulo is wo modulus is one, but we can also show the reverse using uh, Schwartz in inequality. But this is, there are a few technical steps, but you can just believe me, you can also look it up in a paper by Pires, Pires and Garcia from, I think, 2006. So, so this is what I basically just showed. I now show that if we have a matrix product state, that's symmetric under some on-site symmetry operation, the tensors of my matrix product state transform in this form. And just again, let me just still write. This means, so here we have the sum over J, J prime. This would actually be equal to uh, just V, the tensor or the matrix V multiplied with the um, J, right, uh, 
dagger. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say here about symmetries of matrix product states. And this is a relationship that we're going to use uh, in a moment to, to classify different uh, types of phases. Good. This was actually one bit that I wanted to explain last lecture, but I didn't get to do this. Let me now come to symmetry-protected phases. And just to set up the more general scheme, I just want to do the following. So what we are interested in are quantum phases. So, so we say that the temperature for everything we are looking at right now is zero, and we are only interested in one-dimensional systems. And here we can then, uh, i just do this rather quickly because it's just a repetition. So we could say that we have some parameter in our system, we have some parameter, parameter one and parameter two, and we can just look, uh, draw some sort of ground state phase diagram. And we could have just some trivially kind of disordered state. Like the Ising paramagnet, for example. And then we can have, oh, and also we have some symmetries. In fact, if we have 1D bosons without symmetries, this is all there is. So there would be only one phase. There's no, uh, no non-trivial phases without symmetries in 1D. This is different in 2D, there are these topological phases with fractionalization that uh, Paul pointed out. But in 1D, we do not have these. And then we can have some um, phase transition at some point, like where we have some um, singularities, like divergent uh, correlation lengths, etc., into a phase that might be symmetry broken. So this would be a phase like the Ising ferromagnet, where we actually go to a phase where the phase where the symmetries are spontaneously broken. So so this is like a way that we could think of a, a phase diagram for a particular system. But one thing that can also happen, and this is what I'm talking about now is that we can have uh, uh, some transition. You can actually prove this. Uh, you can show that uh, using basically matrix products and transfer matrices, you're assuming a gap. Yes. Yeah, like as I said, like everything in this lecture is focusing on 1D systems that I always assume a gap. And then you can, can show this, that there's only one phase. But in the presence of symmetries, two things can happen. Either these symmetries can be spontaneously broken, or we can have these type of symmetry-protected topological phases. And uh, now I want to focus exactly on these phases and show how we can uh, classify or understand these type of phases. And just to have something concrete in mind, I want to introduce a model, Hamiltonian, which is a spin one Hamiltonian, just a spin one Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So we have SI, SI plus one, plus D times SI Z squared. So in one thing that we could do now is we could use some uh, uh, Maybe in this most direct, we just use some, some numerical tools and just try to look at the phase diagram. And what are we going to find? Now we just have a parameter d here, and d is maybe zero here and uh, very large here. What we're going to find is that if d is very small, we are in a gapped phase, and in a gapped phase that's symmetric. And then at some point, we see that there's a critical point. So we see that. Uh, the system is critical and we have diverging correlation lengths, etc. And then we're just entering another gap phase. And it's a spin one. Spin one Heisenberg chain with a single ion anisotropy, yes? Uh, 
No, what? Well, that is in fact true. I mean, what I mean by gapped is that we have a ground state, and then we have gap to some excitation continuum. This is what I mean by gap. And in this case, this ground state, at least in the uh, infinite or, or I I in infinite chain or like this periodic boundary condition, is actually it doesn't make any symmetries, so the ground state is unique. So the uniqueness I would account to no to to the ground state being symmetric, and what I mean by gap is basically that there's a gap to the excitation continuum. So we have here a phase transition between two symmetric phases, and then it just uh, we ask uh, um, why. I mean, wha what what's how, how do we understand this? I mean, how do we actually understand uh, the difference between these two um, phases? And this is a, a question that I want to answer now. Well, in principle, I don't, I would say. Uh, I, I know from what I can tell you, but actually this is also one of the things that I, in the beginning, was quite confused by, because if we have... So, so for example, if we boil water, so we might think that um, liquid water and... Uh, uh, and the vapor are in different phases because there's a, a there's a phase transition between those two. But then we see, actually, if we just heat it up under pressure, there is actually a way to continuously connect these two phases. Though these are not really gap phases, this is a different story. But just seeing this picture, I wouldn't know, I, I cannot, at least I, 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 I don't have any reasons to believe that there is no such path. Maybe if I just go outside the uh, board and come back, there might be a way to adiabatically, well, without closing the gap, to go from here to here. But with something that I want to say now, we can actually exclude this possibility. Yes? No, th this is what we're going to find. And we're going to find that there is a topological invariant that distinguishes these two symmetric phases. But if I wouldn't know these this fact, if I don't know these two level theories, all I, all I know is uh, Landau's theory of, uh, um, of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, and I see a picture like this, I wouldn't, or at least I wouldn't know why these two phases should be different. And in fact, if I actually increase the spin to two, so I can take the same type of Hamiltonian, and I, but I go to a spin two phase, uh, if I go to, 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 to local um, um, spin twos, this, these two points are actually adiabatically connected if you find a symmetric path. But this is what we're going to, this is what I'm going to show in a second how this works. Good. Yes. Here I mean, um, for simplicity, I will only talk of this type of symmetry. Yeah, so let me just discuss this Hamiltonian a bit. Like this, this first part of the Hamiltonian has a lot of symmetry. So this is uh, SO3 symmetric for spin rotations about arbitrary like the axis. It is time reversal symmetric. It is uh, inversion symmetric, so it has spatial symmetries. It's translational invariant. Um, so there's uh, many, many symmetries that we have. Once we add this term here, this single ion anisotropy, it's still time reversal symmetric, tr translation invariant, but the SO3 symmetry is broken down to uh, Z2 direct product of uh, uh, U1. So if, if this would be a spin, we can just rotate it like this around the Z axis, or we can flip it by 180 degrees. So this Hamiltonian does have many symmetries, and some of them are of this type, like the um, spin rotation symmetries. But on top of this, we have other kind of symmetries, like time reversal symmetry, etc. And the ground state in either phase, like in the phase left of roughly one and right of roughly one, both have all the symmetries, like in both cases, the ground state has all the symmetries of, of the Hamiltonian. Good. 
And now I want to actually discuss what distinguishes these phases. I want, I want to introduce some labels or some stickers that we can put on these two phases to distinguish them. And by understanding this, we will actually be able to understand what kind of symmetries we need to keep to actually keep those two uh, uh, distinct. And for this, we need to introduce some tools. And the tool I want to introduce are uh, projective representations. So projective representations are particular representations of a, uh, of a group. These are, let's now assume that we have some group G. And this group G could be, for example, the symmetry group of Z2 cross U1, or it could be just Z2 or Zn. Like any, think of your favorite symmetry group, and these G and H are now elements from this symmetry group. And now we just form a representation of the symmetry group. So we have U of G and U of H is equal to U uh, G times H. So this would be a linear representation of uh, the group G. A projective representation is now just a linear representation modulo some phase factor. So u times g times u times h is e to the i some phase factor depending on gh times u times gh. So this is now a projective representation. And these guys, these um, phase factors that we have, are called the, the factor set. I think. And we have a lot of freedom of choosing these phases. We only want to make sure that the representation uh, is associ associative. So we have some, so, so these phases have to fulfill certain consistency uh, conditions. And again, if all of those phases are zero, then, this, then the representation is just a simple linear representation. And now we can ask the following question. So we can say that we have a group, and now we just wrote down some symmetry operation. So, so now we just write down for this group some factor set, which is um, consistent. And then we just do this again. We just find some other factor set. And now the question is the following. Just by rephasing operators, can we, like, so maybe u, this u tilde of g is equal to e to the i alpha g times u g. So now we just allow for just rephasing those operators. So let me, let's say that we just add some uh, phase factor to this representation of u. And then we find for the uh, factor set is transforming as that we have tilde is equal to the gh plus alpha gh minus alpha h. So and a question we can ask, and I think it was Isaac Schur who asked this, this question for the first time more than 100 years ago, is if I now have these two projective representations, just by rephasing these operators, can I actually just lift one of these representations to the other? And the question might be, can I do this? Can I just get rid of any kind of phase? So, so if I just find a projective representation, can I, for example, always remove the phases? Can I always lift it to a trivial representation by doing this trick or not? And the answer is that there are actually different classes. So there can be different classes of projective representations. And all of those classes, or like all the um, phases that lie in a particular class, can be kind of transformed into each other using this uh, rule. And those that are in different classes cannot be transformed into each other. And now I actually want to demonstrate this idea by uh, looking at two examples. Oh, 
before going to the examples, I want to just blame it. So these different classes uh, that Shure came up with are now called the um, second, the second cohomology group, second cohomology uh, group, and this is usually labeled as H two of some group G over U one. I think they used to be called maybe sure, sure multipliers. So let us now look at um, some examples. Because now we can just, yes? Uh, what? A linear representation? Right. By trivial, sorry, may I, see, I by trivial I meant linear. <laughs> sorry, hmm? like all faces are zero. So basically, I just kind of come up with this, with some set of fancy faces, and then you just sit down and just say like, well, I just removed all of them, and now you're just left with a linear representation where all faces are are zero. And I just was sloppy and I just called this trivial representation, but. I mean, it's lifted to a linear representation. Good. But let me now, because now we can exi uh, play exactly this game. So we can say that let us just come up with the group that we like. And this, let's start with a very simple one, which is Zn. So Zn is the symmetry group of a star. This star clearly has no symmetries, but imagine it uh, was done more symmetrically. And then we have certain elements in our group, which is the identity r and to r n minus 1. So r means that we rotate the star by one click. So this is we r. And then we just take the powers of this. And in particular, we find some identity. So if we take r to the power of n, this is the identity, because then the star returned to where we, we started from. What does it mean? So now we can actually just introduce a projective representation. We can say that, well, if we take u of uh, r, let me see, how do I write it here? So if we just take, well, u is under, like we have ur, and we just take it to the power of n, this could be e to the i phi times uh, uh, the identity. Okay? So now we have a projective representation. But then we could say that, well, we can now introduce actually some u r, which is uh, just e to the minus i phi divided by n times u r. And now you see that, well, it doesn't matter what kind of phi you came up with, it's gone. Because then you actually made it, uh, uh, you just found that. Uh, U R to the power of n is then actually the identity. So here, or the, the the result actually is that if you have a group of Z n, there are no non-trivial projective representations because all of them can be lifted to a trivial representation. Okay, so let's do something more fancy, and this would be the group Z two. Or Z2 cross Z2, or direct product Z2. And this group is the group of uh, a block, say. Oops. Something like this. And now we have two orthogonal axes, which you can call maybe X and Z. And we can rotate this by pi, like we have rx, about the x-axis, and we have rz, rotating it by pi about the z-axis. Right. So uh, this group has an element, identity, rx, rz, so these are just rotations by, by pi, and we have rx, 
Rz, which is actually a rotation about the y-axis. So, so now we can just ask the same question that we did before for the Zn group. And first of all, we find that Rx squared is equal to Rz squared is the identity, because if you just rotate it twice, we just go back. Which means we can actually have ux squared uz squared is equal to the identity of c. So using this trick, we actually fix the phase factors for ux and uz. Right? So, so we just used exactly the same trick to basically lift stuff to the, uh, to the, uh, 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 to the, to the linear representation that we can do here. Uh, basically by, 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 by using this identity that we square or take it to the power of n. But then there's another identity because Rx and Rz commute. Rx is equal to Rx, Rz is equal to Rz times Rx. But if you just rotate it like this and then like this, or we rotate it like this and then like this, I guess. It's I probably made a mistake. <laughs> Let me see. So like, like this or like this or like this and like this. It doesn't matter. Did I do it wrong again? I don't know. So, but we have this identity. So, but then we can have another phase factor, namely for uz, ux and uz can be plus or minus uz times ux. It can be only plus or minus because it's a order two group. So the, the square has to go to one again. So, from this, we actually find that we have here some phase factor. And this phase factor, we cannot undo, because we already fixed the phases for ux and uz, so we cannot do anything about this phase factor. So now we actually found that if we have the group z2 cross z2, there are actually two different classes of representation. So there is either the trivial or the linear one, and the one where ux and uz are anti-commute. If you just think of spin systems, we actually see that there's two different classes. There's a class of integer spins, where the ro rotations commute, and there are half integer spin, where the ux and uz actually anti-commute. And this we should keep in mind, because this is exactly the tool we can use to characterize different uh, symmetry-protected topological phases. So maybe take some questions if there are some. If there are none, we just have a break. Oh no, is it break now or in 15 minutes? Okay, uh, let me see. Yeah, maybe I take a break now because it's just a logic. Yes? Hmm? Oh, this, this second cohomology group is basically the group that we get to classify the different types of phases. So here, for example, for Z2 cross Z2, yeah. uh, the uh, second cohomology group is Z2. So it's either 0 or 1. It's either a linear or a projective representation. And for the Zn group, this group here would be just, uh, just a trivial group, just it's just a group structure you get from the different classes of inequivalent projective representation that you have. Well, I know that there can be only two options because this is the, the group is of order two. So if we square it, it has to go back to uh, one. If I square this, I, I know that ux squared is equal to u squared is equal to one. So if I square this equation, I want to have it. Yes. No, no, this, this is the next step that I want to explain because right now, this is just the math. So you can just basically say you just have these two different classes of projective representations. 
So you can write down other classes. Or you, sorry, there are only two classes, but you can, of course, just instead of having ux squared equals to u squared, you can just put in here whatever kind of phases that you like. And this will affect then these phases as well. So using this, well, I removed this uh, relation between these different phases. But this is now just basically for the, for the, um, uh, for, for, for the sort of mathematical point of view, but if you go to the, to these, uh, uh, and this is what I want to show then maybe after the break, is that if we have a state, a particular state, or basically how a state transforms under symmetry operation will actually give us a particular projective representation. And then basically we can just read off in which class we are. Yeah, there. So, so we can go to various phases. So, so if you if you go to S O three, it also still has only two classes. But yeah, I mean, y yes, yes, it can be done. I mean, you can also have it over Z two, and this is then relevant for some other. I mean. I just naming the things, there are these kind of so-called symmetry and rich topological phases, and for those uh, you have a classification, I think, with G and Z2. So there are different, groups and it but I don't know the, it's very easy to get lost on this literature, to me at least, yeah. Yes? Well, here it's rather straightforward because it's relatively simple. But if we have a more complicated group, I wouldn't know how to do this carefully. But I know that there are some books where they uh, give for different, you, you just look at the group in, and then they basically um, show what the uh, cohomology uh, groups are. But in fact, I for, for a more complicated group where I cannot do this by hand, I wouldn't even know how to how to derive it carefully. Similar to this one, but... But this would, I mean, like, how does gaming, I, I know for these uh, uh, kind of any algebras, it's like an NP hard problem. Is it here similar? Or, I mean, how? For simple, uh, th there are these tables where I can just look it up. I know there are some where you kind of can exclude that they, like there are some groups where you know that they're only trivial ones because of some non-abelian stuff, but, uh, but I don't know the, the general well, framework. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, if there are no more questions, then let's uh, have a break.
Okay. Okay. Let's continue. So, what I said in the first part was mainly just talking about the idea of projective representations, and I showed that for certain symmetry groups, there can be inequivalent projective representations, and from the mathematicians, we know how to classify different projective representations. So, now I want to use this to actually classify different symmetry-protected topological phases. And with what we have set up now, it's actually relatively simple, this idea. And let me just state how we do this. We just take our ground state and assume that our ground state is now given in a matrix product state representation in this canonical form. And then I figure out how do actually these matrices transform under my symmetry group. So let us just say I have my Z2 cross Z2 symmetric Hamiltonian. And we just look at the representation of, say, U like if you have, like in using the same notation as before, we have here Rx and Rz. We just apply it to our matrices and figure out how do these matrices transform under uh, the symmetry. And then it turns out that the symmetries, the representation of V here, in terms of this uh, virtual index of these matrices, is actually either a linear or a projective representation. Uh, and this is what I want to um, state now. So now we can actually just use this. So let us now assume that Psi is symmetric uh, with respect to some symmetry group G. And this is like this on-site type of symmetry. And I require that uh, U I, like of uh, all the Gs, where G is in uh, G, is a linear representation. So I, I require that the on-site symmetries are linear representations. At this point, one could actually, uh, one can actually connect it to some sort of generalization of liebschultz mattes theory. Because if the representation of the on-site, if, if the on-site symmetry is projective and the system does not break translation invariance, then the state is actually gapless and in the class of states that we do not like to describe as matrix product states. So here we're going to require that the on-site representation is uh, linear. So for example, an integer spin model. And then we find that the uh, uh, yeah. So then we actually find that the representation V here uh, are actually or can be uh, projective representations. And all we have to do then is to say that well, if we have some state, or some ground state of a given Hamiltonian, we just need to figure out what kind of uh, representations these uh, matrices V are. Right? So we have, so, so if you have Rx, we get some Vx and uh, V dagger X, and we just have to check if they are projective or linear, and then we can actually uh, read off what kind of uh, class this phase belongs to. So there's a direct correspondence between the kind of classification of different projective representations and the classification of different uh, symmetry protected topological phases. And I want to demonstrate this now by looking at a concrete example, namely this example that I had before. And this was, let me just still write down the Hamiltonian again. It's a 
i i plus 1 plus d times sc squared and this is the spin 1 model and let us now look at the two different phases so so here we have this parameter d how does the ground state look like if we go to the limit of d being infinitely large someone idea right so the spin so the local hilbert space is like minus 1 0 uh, plus 1 and if this hamiltonian if if d is very large it would actually just like to put all the spins in the sz equals to zero eigenstate and which means that the cartoon picture we can have of this phase is just a simple product state where all the spins are in an sz equals to zero eigenstate so this is the eigenstate at, at d equals to infinity and then as we just go away from this uh um, limiting case we will find some quantum fluctuations on top of the state but morally this is kind of the kind of state that I like to think of what about here if we go to say d equals to zero um, then the state the Hamiltonian is not really simple but we can actually and this has been shown at least numerically we can actually adiabatically transform this Hamiltonian where d is equals to zero to this Hamiltonian that I wrote down at the end of the first lecture namely this uh, AKLT Hamiltonian so to have a cartoon picture of this phase that we have here we can look at this uh, AKLT Hamiltonian and let me just briefly discuss how this looks like if we have this uh, AKLT Hamiltonian, H A K L T, this Hamiltonian is simply the uh, sum over I P I I plus one, and this is a projector onto the S equals to two states. And at this, for this Hamiltonian, we can write down the ground state exactly. And as I already pointed out, the ground state of this Hamiltonian as an exact matrix product state representation. And let me just describe how this state looks like. So this state looks the following. We just have our spin one sides. So each of those ones is like a spin one side. And we think of these spin ones splitting up into two spin one halves. And the ground state is formed by having like each of these are singlets between the two spin one halves like one half like uh, up down minus down up so what I said is that we don't really know exactly what the ground state is for this Hamiltonian but we know it's adiabatically connected to this Hamiltonian and for this Hamiltonian we know exactly how the ground state looks like and in particular, we can actually um, uh, have a state that we can represent exactly as a matrix product state. So, and I wrote it down already last time, but the ground state of, of or like the, the matrix product state representation of the state is of the following form. We have like these matrices, gamma, uh, say minus one. This is for the physical state minus one is square root of two third times zero one zero zero gamma zero is equal to minus square root of three times one zero zero minus one and gamma plus is equal to minus square root of zero zero one two and uh the gamma is just uh, uh, one divided by square root of two and one divided by square root of two. Okay. So 
So and since the state is really simple, what we can do is we can actually uh, figure out what the um, representation of the symmetry is. So again, what we like to do is we want to look at the um, now at some symmetries, and I pointed out there are several symmetries in this Hamiltonian that actually project uh, uh, that protect symmetry uh, that protect these topological phases. But I want to look at the one that we looked at before, which is the uh, uh, z uh, z two cross z two uh, symmetry. And in this in this uh, spin system, this z two cross z two symmetry is the symmetry of uh, flipping spins by 180 degrees about two orthogonal axes. I said already that this Hamiltonian has a larger symmetry. The symmetry is actually a Z2 direct product of uh, U1. So we can, I don't know, if you just look at this Hamiltonian, well, if you look at this first part Hamiltonian, we can just rotate the spin on the sphere. If we just, if we add this term, we can still rotate it like this about the Z axis and the Hamiltonian is invariant under this transformation. But we can also just uh, flip it by 180 degrees about the other axis. So we just take now this subgroup of the symmetry that we have. I'll just take. Like, let me see, I just do it like this. So this is Z2 cross Z2. And now I say that, well, I take then, I just introduce some axes here. And now I just take the, uh, like this Z2 that we had before. And now I just say that, well, I just take those points. So I just allow to flip from here to here. Yeah. So I just. And now, for the um, now I can just go ahead and look how does my matrix product state transform and the way just to remind you what I want to do is I take my tensor gamma here and here I have the physical index which is uh, uh, maybe we call it J and we have here alpha beta so this is this index from just a spin one degree of freedom and here we have this index alpha beta which is this index here, I would say alpha and beta for these matrices. And now I apply here the spin rotation, say Rx or Rz. These are the rotations of Z2 cross Z2, or the generators of Z2 cross Z2. And now I want actually to uh, represent, so, so first of all I have some overall phase, which I think I forgot to write before, and then we just have it with some v, v dagger. And now I want to find actually this uh, v and v dagger. And I'm going to give you in a moment like a generic way of doing this, but let me just uh, first do this by hand because it's so simple here. So first I can just write down what is uh, R, Rz in this spin one basis. So let me just be a bit slow. So Rz is just e to the minus, say, i pi of uh, Sz. And these are, the s these are the spin one operators. So Sz is just uh, a diagram matrix of uh, minus 1, 0, and 1. So it seems the diagram is rather easy to obtain the exponential of this one. So this is the matrix which is minus 1, 1, minus 1. Okay. And now I just kind of multiply this matrix or like contract this matrix with this tensor on this physical index. I want to figure out how does actually the uh, how do these actually transform under this uh, operation? And what I actually find, uh, I'm just going to write it th down the result, but I'm going to show that this is actually true. <laughs> that the representation of 
RZ in terms of the virtual indices is just sigma Z. And you can see this, for example, if you look at uh, how does this guy here transform, if you just look at, or maybe this one is simpler. So if you just take how does gamma zero transform, gamma zero transforms with uh, sigma Z. So if I just multiply sigma Z, it commutes. So we don't get uh, any phase. And if we just look at um, this one here, you find it actually gives a phase of minus one. If you just multiply from the left and from the right sigma z to this one, it just flips sign. So here we find that uh, vz is actually vz is equal to sigma z. And we can do the same for rx. For rx, we find it's uh, minus one, minus one, minus one. And then we find vx is equal to sigma x. And there's actually one thing that I know I didn't check it because the overall phase here, maybe I just did something wrong, but uh, this one here is minus one. Let me see why. I I know that the result is true. Maybe I just got wrong. So, but this phase factor here, this overall phase, we get a minus one, and we find for the representation of vz sigma z, and for vx sigma x. And uh, this means that the representation of z2 cross z2 is in terms of half integer spins. So it's actually a projective representation. So basically, from from this, we find that. Uh, in the kind of projective representation of the of the two cross the two, so uh, I just put a pi here because we just find it uh, the representation of R X and R Z anti commute. Does it make sense? Why is it minus one? Where uh, this one here? Yeah, that's why I said I maybe <laughs> I, I just put it down in my notes like this. Uh, I mean, I know that the factor is, is minus one from when I calculated it, but I now don't see it. If Was it? Then I have to change. N yeah, but then it wasn't consistent. So, so I think that uh, the, the result, because it has to be true for all components, and the only consistent way of doing this is actually having a minus one here and having here these sigma x and sigma z's. It's not arbitrary. Uh, but I have, maybe this is a nice homework to check this. I just look at this state and carefully check, more carefully than I did now apparently, to see how, how do the representations look like uh, for, for those rotations. Yes? You mean, I mean, here I'm just using this as, a, as some sort of topological invariant because this is now a quantity. I showed it can be either zero or pi. It can either be a linear or a projective representation. And this cannot be changed gradually. It's, like it's either one or the other. Yes, so, right, let me just come back to this question in a moment. So let me first, I mean, th this is a very question, I, I'm going to address this in a moment, but, le but right now I just wanted to use it as a, as a way how we can basically create labels for different phases, and there's no arbitrariness in, in this. I mean, we have this matrix product state which for which we get this canonical form, which is 
up to some overall phase vectors unique. And from this canonical form, we can extract how these matrices transform under symmetry operations, which are also uh, unique up to some overall phases. So now we actually have a unique way of creating some labels or uh, kind of topological invariants that we can put. And it's pi in this state, in this AKLT phase, and it's actually true for the entire phase. And it is, if you go to the simple phase where we just have a simple product state of sigma uh, of, of SC equals to zero eigenstates, then we actually find that the uh, representation of U uh, or of V, Vx and Vz are simply just the identities because the rotations don't do anything here. So, which means in, in terms of this phase vector, the phase would just be zero here. So now we actually have two phases, or we have now basically found some labels of these phases uh, given that we have uh, different kind of projective representations that are induced by, by this state. Yes? Yes, and uh, yes, I'm, I'm coming to this, uh, this um, but right now, all I wanted to say is, I mean, I, what I hope that I convinced you is that for ground states of gapped Hamiltonians, we can always find a matrix product state representation that's arbitrary good, and from this matrix product state representation, we can actually uh, read off how they transform under symmetry operations and by this extract some uh, topological invariants um, that we can use to label these different phases and we know that they are different. So what are the um, physical consequences or what, does, what can we actually um, read off from this? And we can actually now relate this basically to uh, edge modes. <laughs> so, again, if I now take my state, so I take my state that was formally defined on an infinite chain, and I cut out a block out of this, then I find that these matrices or these these objects here um, these matrices V for example um, they cancel everywhere in the bulk except and then we just keep some of them at the boundary right so basically this, these matrices uh, V that we derived here from the matrix product state representation actually tell us about how the boundaries of this block uh, transform under the symmetry. And if we now, if, if we now look at some, some, so, so if, if we actually, let me see how to put it in the best way. Uh, what I can read off from this is that we find uh, degeneracies for, for the entanglement Hamiltonian. I mean, I'm still not at the physical consequences very much, but let me still talk about this because now if we have these boundaries then at least if these boundaries are far enough from each other then these indices that we have with these um, alphas they label the eigenstates of the reduced density matrix for this block and if I have now these boundaries transforming 
under these projective representations, then I know that the eigenstates of the um, reduced density matrix will be degenerate. So, and again, we have these sort of edge modes as we have in the, uh, in the case that uh, Paul discussed. In particular, we know if we have rho n, and this has some eigenvalue of the, uh, I don't know, rho n times psi n, and now s we can actually um, show that these matrices V, they commute with the reduced density matrix, which is because they commute with these lambdas by definition. Then we actually know that this is actually, so we can just put in the V here. So then this is actually the same, so we, they commute, so this is the same as rho times V times, let me just say that we have like Vx here and Vx. Uh, then this is actually equal to the same state. So we have actually two states which have the same eigenvalue. And because of that rho also commutes with Vx, but Vx and Vz anti-commute, we actually find a consequence from having these projective representation is that the spectrum of uh, the spectrum of uh, rho comes in mu multiplets. Yes, but this is one of the examples where it does. I mean, I can actually show, like with this, I can show that if I have, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the only way to get the uh, multiplet structure, but this is a necessary consequence. So if I have edges that transform under projective representations, I can show that every eigenstate of the reduced density matrix comes in certain uh, multiplets. So, and here, for example, for this uh, uh, AKLT, or like for this Haldane phase, or for the AKLT phase, I can actually play this trick for uh, the left and the right edge, so I know that every state in the spectrum of the reduced density matrix comes in multiplets of four. So we have at least a four degeneracy of all the eigenstates. Sorry, what is rho? Rho was a reduced density matrix. So rho is a reduced density matrix for for this block. Yes. So, but this is now a, a necessary um, consequence from, from the fact that we have these projective representations. Now, another fact, or uh, this is not really physical because it concerns only the uh, reduced density matrix, but Another fact, I mean, a, a real physical consequence of this is the existence of so-called uh, string order parameters. Uh, yeah? Uh, yes? Well, what's going to happen is that if you, these edge modes are basically the uh, depth of how deep these edge modes reach into the bulk depends on the correlation length. And uh, if you kind of approach the, the critical point, then the correlation lengths will diverge and the edge modes will be extended over the entire system. But this is also where this matrix product state representation will break down. There are two states. No, no. The um, so so in 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 this model, like I at this AKLT state, we have uh, 
we have these effect like spin one half state sitting here by set. So we have, I just removed it, but in this AKLT type of uh, states, we have integer, like we have spin one degrees of freedom on site, but at the boundary here, we have uh, half integer spins. I mean, as I drew this picture, I it's simple to see actually for the um, for the AKLT state. So for the AKLT state, I drew this picture here, where we can actually see the degeneracy. So you see that in the bulk, all of the spins forming singlets, but then at the boundary, we have these uh, spin one half degree of freedom. which are not coupled to, to anything else in this extreme limit. And then we actually see the fourfold degeneracy. So we have uh, up or down on the left and up or down on the right. But this is here only for this particular AKLT state. But using this argument about these projective representations where the irreducible representation is always uh, like at least two-dimensional, uh, uh, blocks of two-dimensional uh, poly matrices, we know that all eigenstates will be uh, at least uh, uh, fourfold degenerate. Mm. Yes? No, this is what I so, so here I was talking about the eigenstates of the reduced density matrix. So this is like I, I take the ground state. So this is, these are grounds, so I take the ground state and I look at the eigen, uh, at the spectrum of the reduced density matrix. And for excited states, I think this will not be true because like for, if you have excited states, then we have the, um, then at least this framework wouldn't work because if we have states that are far up in the spectrum, they would no longer have, uh, have this matrix product state representation. Is that a good question? I don't know. It's because in the even case, uh, Paul could show that there is actually these exact zero modes, and we know that all the states also high up on the spectrum are degenerate, but I think this would not apply here. I think this is true for this and spectrum of the reduced density matrix, but not true for the entire Hamiltonian. Good. Yes? Oh, Vx and Vz both commute. Yeah. So. Oh, because uh, the, let me just. So the argument was such that we had the transformation of this, these tensors and they transform like modulus some, I don't know, some, some phase factor where we had these matrices say, say uh, just we are applying here R, X, or Z, and then we have X or Z, and uh, V, X, or Z dagger. And these here commute with these lambdas, right? By definition, V, X, V, Z, they commute with lambda. And if I look at a large block, and the two ends are far away from each other, then the uh, reduced density matrix for the block uh, has basically a product structure of the left and the right part. So that's UCs. We have then alpha, beta, and this one. In, in if I have like a diagonal representation of these, of the reduced density matrix, it would be just a product structure of the left and the right part. And since it commutes with both of them, we just uh, find that it also commutes with the uh, reduced density matrix for the entire block. Good. And having this insight now that the um, that basically the um, the phases 
differ in terms of having projective or linear representations, we can then also see that if we generalize the spin one Heisenberg chain or the spin one AKLT to higher spins, for example, to spin two, then we find that if we take a spin two Heisenberg chain, that the uh, um, Heisenberg model is not in an SBT phase, but rather in a trivial phase. Because if we just keep the same picture, but just go up from spin one to spin two, we would find that the edge modes are actually uh, spin ones, and the spin ones are in a trivial representation. So if I actually do exactly this, I will actually find that if I just look at the phase diagram for uh, spin two, what I actually find is if I just increase D, if I make D very large, it's in the same kind of product state form. If D is small, it's in this phase, or it's adiabatically connected to this state. And in between, there's a critical region. So, and, and seeing this phase diagram might, might be misled to think that the spin one argument also carries over to spin two, namely that there are two different phases, but this is not true. So in, for integer spins, the two phases are actually adiabatically connected. And uh, this we can already see by the fact that the predictive representations are, are the same. So in both cases, the representations are, are trivial. And let me now also say that because what I explained now in detail is for symmetries, which are these kind of product symmetries or symmetries of uh, these uh, local operators. But we can also have these kind of symmetry protected topological phases protected by other symmetries. And one of the symmetries is, for example, spatial inversion. So say that we have a lattice where we labeled sites like minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. And now we have a transformation where we just i to minus i minus 1. So we just uh, flip it around one bond. We can also, I mean, that is a symmetry that uh, can also detect symmetries. And in this case, we find that the MPS transforms to its transpose. Right? So we just take the tensors that we had on a side and we just transpose them. So in this infinite MPS, it literally, because it's translation invariant, it just amounts to just taking the transpose of those matrices. And in that case, we can similarly show that there's a relation of how those matrices transform under the symmetry. Namely, we find that the transpose is Transforming as plus or minus v times gamma, I like to do some index j, j, v. And this matrix v in this case uh, is either a symmetric or anti symmetric matrix. So v transpose is plus or minus 1. So in th the case of uh, inversion symmetry, we have two distinct phases which we can differ distinct like which which we can uh, recognize by v either commuting uh, v either being a symmetric or anti-symmetric matrix and also for time reversal time reversal uh, and for time reversal or um, we would find that we have a transformation of the matrix product state gamma j going to uh, well basically just to the complex complex conjugate, and again we can uh, trans find we can show that there is a transformation of this type, and again we find that v can be either symmetric or anti-symmetric. 
So here I'm not, I do not want to go into the detail how to um, show that these two cases exist in, in both cases, but it's, uh, uh, it shows us that these are in, in, in this kind of spin one chain that we looked at before, there are various symmetries. I mean, there are these spin rotation symmetries, inversion symmetry as a spatial symmetries, and also time reversal symmetry. And all these symmetries protect actually this particular symmetry protected phase. So as long as any of those symmetries, so and as long as we have uh, a spin rotation which has Z2 cross Z2 as a subgroup, or we have uh, inversion, like, like bond-centered inversion, or we have uh, time reversal symmetry, we have a distinct uh, topological phase. And what I find useful about this is that this framework can be applied to any one-dimensional uh, bosonic system. So if we just have a Hamiltonian and we find that the ground state is symmetric, we can use these ideas and uh, check if the ground state that we find is a simple disordered uh, state or if it belongs to one of those uh, topological phases. And I use the bosonic nature by saying that the operators, if they are far away from each other, they will always commute, they will not talk to each other at all. But if you have fermionic systems, you can have operators being fermionic. And let me just, uh, so let me just say it in words. So if you have a fermionic system, you can apply the same ideas, but they become slightly different in that you say that for this Majorana chain, you have a Z2 symmetry. So this is a, the charge conservation symmetry. And now you can actually look, if you draw a picture like this one here, and you just look, how does the, um, how, how do you measure the charge modulo two in, in our segment? And you can again do this by operators that acting only on the edges of the chain. But the nature of these operators changes in the two phases. If you are in the, in, in the fermionic phase, the operators acting at the edges, or like the fractionization of the symmetry, is in terms of fermionic operators. And in the trivial phase, this fractionization is into a product of two bosonic operators. So basically, you can then show if these operators are bosonic or fermionic to, differ, to distinguish the trivial and the non-trivial, or the, the, the Majorana phase from the trivial phase. And if you just include this fact that operators can, at these operators can either be bosonic or fermionic, you can arrive with this framework at this Z8 classification. So because in the discussion yesterday it came up that if you have this BDI, the, or this BD, BDI class, that then Z, the Z classification that you have for non-interacting systems breaks down to Z8 if you include interactions. And using basically these tools that I showed today by like looking how matrix product states transform under these symmetries, plus the fact that these operators acting at the edges of the system can either be bosonic or fermionic, you can arrive exactly at this classification. So this is, is basically an application of those tools that I, I showed today. Good. And let me just close by uh, giving some idea how we can now extract it. Uh, because let us now say that we, and this is what we're going to do next in the, in, the, in the last lecture, I want to, to show how we can use this in a more practical way. Because in the first lecture, I just sort of conceptually intro introduced matrix product states. Now I introduced how we can use this concept basically of uh, uh, classifying states, but indeed if we have the matrix product state representation of, of a state, we can just extract the uh, matrices uh, Vx and Vz or whatever they are for those symmetries directly. And the idea is now the following. So 
let us now assume that we have uh, an infinite system and we just do a cut here. So we just get now the Schmidt states for the right. And with this canonical form, we again know exactly how to obtain it. It's just simply the um, product of all these matrices to the, le uh, to the right of the cut. Now, I already told that, well, if we, now we just apply our symmetry operation on this guy, and we get our symmetry transformed state. So this is now the symmetry operation acting on our Schmidt state, uh, alpha here. And now we can just uh, calculate the overlap with the state alpha prime. So what we basically obtain now is the representation of the symmetry operation in terms of the Schmidt state. So basically, but now we can actually use what we learned before. So, so, so this is gamma. Let me just draw a few more less because then it's, so this is going up to infinity. But now we can use exactly the uh, relationships that we derived, namely of how these matrices transform. So this is then gamma. And in the bulk, all the uh, matrices V, they just cancel each other. So, but now what we have here is exactly just the product of all these transfer matrices. Oh, sorry. And here we have our V that we get from the transformation. But now we know that since we've chosen this matrix product state in the particular canonical form, we find that all of those multiply to identities. So this is actually just V times the identity. So all we need to do to extract these particular representation is we find the dominant eigenvector of this generalized transfer matrix. So we just call this here T. So we just find basically that the dominant, that we have just some, that our V is the dominant eigenvector of the generalized transfer matrix. And this eta is of modulus one because the state is symmetric. So that is at least as I want to show in the next lecture, extremely convenient. So all we need to do is we just say we start from a microscopic Hamiltonian that we have, we just minimize the energy and optimize the matrix product state, and then we just construct this generalized transfer matrix. If we just have one matrix, we diagonalize it and find now the dominant eigenvector, and this is now the, uh, these are exactly the projective representations. And then we can just calculate some commutator of those matrices. So we can see for this case of Z2 cross Z2 and check whether they commute or anti-commute. And from this, we know what kind of uh, uh, topological phase we are in. Good. Questions? Yeah, so the transfer matrix I think I was so this is a transfer matrix. So the transfer matrix has indices alpha, alpha prime, beta, beta prime. So I just basically group these matrices. So I group these indices here to pairs of two. And now I just multiply it with a matrix that would be beta, beta prime. So I get, I make this one, this one is a rank four tensor, but I make it a matrix by just basically grouping these indices. And then this matrix is an eigenvector for this super operator, if you wish.
And the sum here is over beta and beta prime, right? Yes? Uh huh. Yeah. No, th this is a good point. So if uh, if you want to analyze, so you have a Hamiltonian and want to analyze or figure out the phase diagram of this Hamiltonian, you would have to look for all possible symmetries because first of all, you just have to check if these symmetries are spontaneously broken and to do basically look for a kind of conventional phase diagram. And then if you found that, oh, there are now multiple patches in my phase diagram where the symmetries are not broken, you would then have to do this analysis and to check which kind of symmetries actually form projective uh, form symmetry protective topological phases and which ones are in trivial phases. Oh, I'm not sure if we, uh, maybe I understand what you are saying. Uh, so, so I think what you are saying is if we take, for instance, the uh, I Ising model, so you say that, well, we just take the, the, the Ising Hamiltonian, sigma x, sigma x, plus h times sigma z, and you say that if you tune from here to here, we know that there has to be a phase transition because in one phase, the Z2 symmetry is, is broken and the other phase, the Z2 symmetry is preserved. And then if you add like some epsilon type sigma, sigma x to it, actually this symmetry is broken and we can actually go without breaking the symmetry spontaneously so without having to undergo a phase transition. And the same is true in, in these SPT phases. If, for example, you just look at this uh, model with a large D, where we have this phase diagram where we had a phase transition at this point, and you add a perturbation to the Hamiltonian that breaks time reversal and inversion and spin rotation symmetry, so it which breaks all of them, then actually you can just go adiabatically from one to the other. Then the notion of those symmetries or these different phases is actually gone. Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, it buys you a, uh, which I didn't discuss. Well, I mean, this kind of, I think it's a relevant or like an interesting uh, question to label different phases of meta, right? So if, if we could say uh, you have some some Hamiltonian with some uh, parameter and you tune to the system and you see, well, at some point the system, you notice that system has a phase transition. Uh, people might be interested in being able to put labels on different phases. I mean, that is a, a useful concept to just classify different phases of meta that we can have. Yeah, I mean, you can, based on, hmm? so you can, uh, for, for every kind of uh, symmetry protected topological phase, you can derive uh, some, some non-local order parameter that you can measure. So, for example, in the presence of the, yeah, this is maybe also, uh, 
So let us say that we have our uh, Z2 cross Z2 symmetry again. Like just take exactly the spin one Hamiltonian. We can look at some uh, order parameter, which is the following type. So we have to take the ground state wave function. We act on it, say, with Sz. And then we just apply e to the minus i pi Sz. Uh, and here we have, say, the product of, uh, so this is maybe on i, and this is from k equal to uh, i plus 1 to j minus 1, and then we have here s j z. So this is this um, so-called of a string order, and we just look at the limit where uh, i minus j goes to infinity. Ah. And if you look at this as some order parameter, um, what, what does it tell us? Uh, let's just first only look at this part in the middle. This middle part here, so, so first of all, what do we expect this, this order parameter to be? First of all, may forget about these terms at the boundary then you would see that this one here is actually the symmetry operation. Right? This is a Z2 rotation, like this is a, a pi rotation about the nexus, and the, the ground state is invariant with respect to this symmetry. So we actually expect in this limit that this will go to a finite number. Right? Take an Ising power magnet and just flip a consecutive number of spins about the, the uh, like this doing like a, a Z2 rotation of these spins, you expect it would be finite. You have like just some, it will be smaller than one because you just do something, you mess something up at the boundaries, but in, in general it would be finite. But now, what turns out, if you have this phase, so say that you have maybe here the Haldane phase and here this large D phase or like the product state phase, you find actually, um, based on some selection rules which are due to these projective representation, that this particular order parameter will be uh, like, let me call this SO. So you will find that SO is, say, larger than zero in the Haldane phase, and this string order is equal to zero in the large D phase. If you change this operator here to the identity, you will actually find this reversed. So you have these string order type correlations that distinguish these phases. And I'm not having the time to do so, but you can actually, just based on having these projective representations of these edges, you can actually show or you can derive these selection rules. And this can be done for all symmetry protected topological phases. You can write down some correlations or like some, some order parameter to distinguish these phases. It's still, I think, maybe academic because you just, just some, some exotic measurements that you can do, but you can propose some measurements to distinguish these phases. Hmm? Well, it's just, it's you, you just have to make sure that the distance between those is large compared to the correlation length. You can actually do exactly, I mean, this is actually, this what I wrote down here actually predates the uh, uh, concepts of, uh, of SBTs somehow. Because what you can do is you can take the uh, Haldane model, or this, this Hamiltonian that I wrote down before, and you do something like a jordan Wigner transformation. It's just like the Kennedy and Tasaki transformation. It's like also some string that you introduce, and then you just transform the local Hamiltonian into another local Hamiltonian by unitary transformation, 
and that transformed Hamiltonian actually has a spontaneous symmetry breaking of the C2 cross C2 symmetry. So, so that's very analogous to the Majorana chain in this respect. R right, so you have like this Hamiltonian, this SI, uh, SI plus one. The other Hamiltonian has just like a little bit of decoration to it, but it's not vastly different. It's just uh, another local Hamiltonian that you just can derive for open boundary conditions. With it's spin in a spin linkage, yeah. It's just, it has, it's, it's like for this example of the uh, Ising chain, you also can just basically map between two local Hamiltonians, and you have to the same here. You just have some different operators with the string attached, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yes and no. So this degeneracy that you find here are a bit more general because, for example, if you take uh, some SBT phase that's projected by inversion symmetry, you have inversion symmetry in the bulk, so you would find degeneracies in the entanglement spectrum and the spectrum of the reduced density matrix, but the boundary states, if you just look at the boundary, the boundary actually breaks inversion symmetry, so you do not see degeneracies of the ground state for open boundary conditions. But those symmetries where you actually, which well for most other symmetries, in fact, like for time reversal symmetry or for spin rotation symmetries that are not broken by having open boundary conditions, this carries over. So you can just uh, look either at degeneracies of the eigenstates of the reduced density matrix or at eigenstates of the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Okay, I think there are no more questions, and uh, thank you for your attention.